Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. His name, I just want to see if you can read that. That's a long name. His name was Mephibosheth. Let's jump over to chapter 9, verse 3. If you can't turn that fast, it's okay. It's up on the screen. Here we go. Then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Now, the Bible tells us that Mephibosheth was dropped at the age of five. He became lame at the age of five. This verse in chapter nine is decades later but he's still defined by the person who is lame. Life has a way of defining you by your worst day. His name wasn't the guy who was lame. His name was Mephibosheth, but everybody knew him not by his name. They knew him by his biggest mess up. Life has a way of labeling you based on your biggest mess up. Anybody grateful that God doesn't label you based on your worst day, but he labels you based on his blood covering your life and who he is called you? Read the verse. Stop preaching. Okay, let's go. Verse 4. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Emiel from Lodabar. The king David sent and brought him out of the house of Maker, the son of Emiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, that's a mouthful, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, don't forget the question mark, Mephibosheth? He was the grandson of a king, but he had been so far out of the palace, he no longer looked like royalty. Tell somebody next to you, I'm not what I look like. I may look like average, I may look like normal to you, but I am the child of the almighty God. There is royalty in my blood. Don't judge me how I look. Judge me on who my, who my daddy is. And he answered, and he said, your servant. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Jesus, we come to you this morning. God's saying that we long for you. God, every single person in this room, God, needs something different. Some need healing. Some need breakthrough. Some need you to restore relationships. Some people in this room need you to prove to them that you're real and that you actually care for them. But whatever we stand in need of, God, we know that you're the answer. So have your way in us. Anoint me to speak and anoint me to preach short. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I thought y'all would say a better amen there. Before you sit down, greet two people around you. Tell them, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's, let's. Woo! I messed that up, right? I'm having way too much fun. <laughs> We're starting a brand new series today called The Table is Set. The table, 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 the table is set. We, we like to preach series here at Destiny Harvest um, because the preacher, uh, not me, but the preacher, he's, uh, he's long-winded and he preaches way too long. So what we have told him, me, not me, but me, yes, to do is to take one message and to break it up in a few different parts. So. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be unpacking this thought, this idea of a table, of your table being set, prepared for you. Question for you. Have you ever been dropped? You ever been dropped? Never you, you weren't dropped, you just fell. Anybody in here, you're, you're as clumsy as I am, and, and you, you fell upstairs? Yeah. It takes a special anointing to fall up the stairs. Uh, this is church. Church is the place that you're 
supposed to lay your burdens down. Um, so I have a confession to make this morning. Um, my wife's here, but I figure she can't kill me in uh, front of all these people. So, uh, babe, um, I dropped Zoe. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. It wasn't my fault. Uh, what happened was, well, I, it was a while ago. I didn't know she could roll. And <laughs> the Ravens were playing. <laughs> and she's okay, though. She's okay. I caught her on the second bounce. Um, <laughs> She's going to be just as smart as I am. She's fine. It's great. Y'all pray for me. <laughs> Seriously, though, I, I, I don't know anybody in their right mind who, who likes to be dropped. I, I don't want to go super spooky or super spiritual on you guys or anything like that, but I truly believe that there is a demonic spirit that is gripping this nation. The, the, this spirit... Y'all like, mm, yeah. <laughs> You're going to be disappointed in a second. This spirit, this demonic force from the pit, the abyss of hell, called roller coasters. People actually pay money to be dropped. If that's not the devil, I don't know. What is? The last time I went to an amusement park, it, it was a while ago, and, and somebody bribed me, tricked me in, into this ride. Um, uh, Things called Drop Zone. And it, it, it's one of those rides that they get rid of all the, you know, the fluffy stuff. There's no twists, there's no turns, there's no loops. You just get in, they strap you down. Some like 13 year old that's too young to work, they let them work and strap you in, and you just trust your life. And this kid, if you smoke today, like, are you sober? Like, do you know what you're doing? And then he's like, you'll be all right, you'll be good. And, and, and then it just takes you straight up in the air. It felt like 5,000 stories up. And then it just drops you. What they did not tell me when I was standing in line for 45 minutes is that they would take me up and they would bring my body back down, but they'd leave my soul up there. <laughs> there was a separation. But <laughs> Seriously, like nobody likes to be dropped. Maybe you're like me, and, and you can brag that before, before you got married, that, that you've never been dropped. I, I didn't date a lot of women before I got married, but I, I dated a few, and I'll just tell you right now, ain't none of them dropped your boy. <laughs> ain't all humility. Now, I am not saying that they did not want to drop me. Anybody can relate. I just saw it coming, and I dumped them first. <laughs> Homegirl would call me like, hey, how's it going? It's over. <laughs> what, do, what do you mean? I was just calling to see where you want to go to dinner. Oh, it's still over because you look like you were thinking it's just done. <laughs> I am petty. <laughs> Seriously, though, have you ever been dropped? Maybe a marriage didn't work out. Attorneys, papers, court, at the end of the day, you found yourself dropped. Maybe your manager walked into your office one Friday, gave you a bunch of stuff you weren't listening to, economy cutbacks, whatever. At the end of the conversation, it was clean your desk out. You've been dropped. Maybe it's a grad program that you've been applying to school after school after school and, and waiting and, and letter after letter after letter comes back. Isn't it amazing how flowery they can make rejection sound? We, we love your res. It's not, it's not you, it's us. And just as, at the end of the day, you find yourself dropped. And I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what your experience is. Nobody likes to be dropped. In this passage that we just read, we, we come across the most tragic transfer of power in all of Scripture. The first king of Israel was a, was a man by the name of Saul. Israel came to God and they said, God, we don't want you to be our king anymore. We want a physical king that we can see and touch like everybody else around us. God says, no, 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 you don't want a physical king. I'm telling you, I'm a lot better than a physical king. You don't want to be like everybody around you. They said, no, 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 we actually do want to be like everybody around us. God says, it's not what you want, but I'll give it to you anyway. Sometimes God will give us what we ask for, even though he knows it's not best for us, just to show us that he's really the only one that we need. 
But they gave him this King Saul, and Saul came in, and immediately he had insecurity issues and people-pleasing issues, and, and he started off well. He started off trusting God, but, but after a while, he started smelling himself. You ever met people that they ain't got no power and they're normal? Then all of a sudden, they get a little, a little, a little wand. They get a little name badge. They get just a little bit of power, and you would think they were King Tut. I mean, just, just directing. That's what happened to Saul. He, he started to think, I've built this instead of God. And he turned his back on God, and the moment he turned his back on God, oh, God cursed him. No. God doesn't curse people. God just removed his hand of favor off of Saul's life and placed it on David. Listen to me, if you grew up in a church or in a religious uh, environment that taught you that God will get back at you, that God will curse you, God will punish you for the bad that you've done, listen to me, that's not biblical, that's not what God does. All God does is say, fine, if you're so big and bad, you be God, and he steps back. In this painful world that we live in, you find out what happens. So God removed his favor from Saul, and instantly the Philistines came and invaded Israel because they understood it wasn't Saul's army that was protecting them. It was the army of God that was protecting them. Now the army of God's gone. We're in. They, they came in. They invaded. And in the first battle, Saul and his son Jonathan both lost their life. When the news got back to the nanny who was taking care of Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson and Jonathan's son, instantly she thought if it happened to his granddad, if it happened to his dad, they're coming for him next. And she picks him up and she takes off running. But in her haste to avoid and repeat the past, she ends up dropping him and he becomes lame. I've discovered that if I live life trying to run from my past, I'll end up breaking the future that God has for me. So often we live with these inner vows that will never be like not realizing that looking backwards and running forward, first of all, is just dangerous. Second of all, you can never take hold of all that God has for you when either you or somebody who has influence in your life is constantly saying, watch out for this. Look what happened to your dad. Look what happened to your mom. Look, look what happened to granddad. Don't let it happen to you. And it sounds so good, and we don't realize it's cursing us. Look what happened to your dad. Now you learn how to work hard. You get a job. You, 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 you make money because look what happened to dad. You make money. You can never trust a man. Marry him, but don't trust him. You can't trust men. You can never trust a woman. Eat her cooking, <laughs> if you can. But never trust. Look what happened to me and your dad. Never, never. Without even realizing it, people who are afraid of the past, they impart their fear on us. And instead of taking hold of all that God has for us, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, and we end up prophesying the past onto our future. Maybe you didn't go through some traumatic experience. Maybe you didn't have some major event in your life when you felt like you were dropped. Maybe it's just your expectations that have dropped. If I met you five years ago and I said, tell me, what would your life look like five years from now? What's your goals? Where are you going? Oh, let me tell you, I got my vision board here. I cut and pasted everything out of Time Magazine. This is my house. This is my car. This is my spouse. No, they're married. That's why they were in the magazine. I don't know, someone who looks just like them. I'm having 2.5 kids and a white picket fence. What is 2.5 kids? It's two kids and a dog. Two. <laughs> and you just had your entire life planned out. If I were to come to you today and say, hey, what's the goals for your life? You would say, to make it to Tuesday. That's my goal. That's, that's all the, I need to make it a Tuesday. I need not to kirk out at this job tomorrow. God, please help me not to punch this manager tomorrow. If I could just make it, your expectations have, have dropped. Now, maybe you're in here and you say, Pastor, this is cute, this is cool, I'm just taking this all in or whatever it may be, but I don't know what you're talking about. I've never been to try back and experience my life. My expectations are sky high. I've not been dropped. This is nothing new to me. I don't know what you're talking about. What I really want to know is why I got white pants on and Labor Day's passed already. So I had clean, sorry. <laughs> I did a little bit of research just to make me sound like I was intelligent. So I, I looked up the name Mephibosheth. A lot of names in the Bible, they have meanings that are deeper than just surface, surface level. And, and I looked up Mephibosheth, and what I discovered is the name Mephibosheth broken up into two parts. The Meph part at the beginning of his name means to be dropped, shattered. 
broken. Bosheth means to be shameful, to be disgusting, to be hidden, to be put out of sight. Mephibosheth's name literally means to be dropping and broken and hidden from view. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us this, but this is just me assuming this. I assume that they named Mephibosheth when he was born. But the Bible says he wasn't dropped. He didn't become lame until he was five years old. Listen to me. His future of being broken was prophesied over him the day he was born. You may not realize this, but the Bible says every single person on the planet Earth was born broken. You were born wrong. You were born lame. It says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. All of us used to be just as... They are. You know who they are? They are whoever struggles with something that you don't struggle with. So thus you can look down at they. Everybody has a they. How could they? Who do they think they are? How could they smoke that, drink that, go there, think that? <laughs> we all have people that we look down at and be like, ooh, there goes. You know what the Bible says? You used to be they. Our lives expressing the evil within us, doing every wicked thing that our passions and our evil thoughts might lead us into. This is what the Bible says. You meant to do it. Can we just start with the truth? You meant to do it. You know, we say lies like, I don't know what happened. Something came over me. I just, no, 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 you meant, you picked up your phone, you write a text message, you hit send, you meant to do that, you meant to say that, you knew it would hurt them and you didn't care because you wanted to get back at it, you would, you, you meant to. The Bible says, it says, we started out bad, broken, lame, being born with evil natures and where God's anger just like everyone else. Welcome to Destiny Harvest, the most encouraging place on the planet. <laughs> so here's a question. Whether you went through some situation in your life or maybe you were just born, how, how do I move from this place of being lame? How do I move from this place of being broken? How do I move from where I am to where God's called me to be? I encourage you over these next four weeks, if you would give me the time, we're going to unpack this thought that no matter what your past looks like, it does not define, dictate, or, have, or handicap what God has in store for your future. I, I want you to write, write, write three things down. The first thing I want you to write down is this. My seat, my chair, my, my seat is, is searching for me. The Bible says that as Mephibosheth grew up, he, he went to a city called Lodabar. Lodabar was an outside of the way. It was a place where there was not a lot of crops. There wasn't a lot of food. There wasn't a lot of harvest. It, 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 it was a rough place. It's where people who did not want to be found hid out. And this is where Mephibosheth went. I can't imagine how difficult it was for Mephibosheth being lame to, to get around at a time in history where there weren't wheelchairs and all these different things that we have to help people move. He, he literally was essentially on his own. Not only was his physical state making his life more difficult, but in that time of history, people who were lame were considered outcasts. They were considered an abomination. He was not allowed in the church. He was not allowed into government buildings. He was essentially an, an outcast because of his state. So many people feel like an outcast because of your past. Everybody sees me, but if they really knew me, they would reject me. And we may not go to a physical loader bar, but so often we go to an emotional loader bar. We go to a place where we become satisfied with settling. Yes, I'm the grandson of the king, but this is the best that I could ever expect. We settle for quick fixes of happiness instead of sustained joy. I'm not even worried about joy. I'm not worried about hope. Let me just this Friday have fun. All, all, I'm, all I'm worried about. We're not even thinking about God's best for us, marriage, whatever. I just want to boo. Winter's coming. 
It's cold. <laughs> I just need somebody to hold me. And even though he does not respect you, you're willing to settle for what's familiar because you're not sure does God have anything better. Even though she doesn't honor you and her words constantly tear you down, she's familiar. And you're not quite sure does God have better for you. And you find yourself making Lodabar comfortable. You're in a dead-end job that you hate. It's not a career. It's a job. It's not moving forward. It's not your dream. But yet you've, you've trained yourself to accept it as your reality. Because this is familiar. I don't know what's next. I don't know what's out there. I, I just know this and this. Even though it's not great, it's mine. And I've figured out how to work it and manipulate it and get out of it what I need out of it. So I'm happy to sit here in Lodabar. And in that moment, as Mephibosheth is in this outside city, not being who his dad or his granddad made him to be, there was a conversation going on miles away in the king's palace. Mephibosheth's name was being brought up. There was a king by the name of David that literally said, hey, is there anybody that's still related to Saul that I can give them a seat at my table? Can I bless them? Is there anybody out there that I can bless as a result of Jonathan? I believe that God sent me this morning to let you know that no matter where you are in life, that there are people that are currently talking about you behind your back. Pastor, I know who they are. I know exactly. No. Not talking about you to tear you down or to slander you. We're always talking about haters. You can't have a hater unless you do something. I'm not talking about your haters. I'm saying there are people that are ordained by God. Your name is on their lips to open doors that you didn't even pray for. To bless you in ways that you haven't even dreamed of. In this moment, there are kings that are talking about your business on how they can add contracts to it that you haven't even put a bid for. I am telling you, there is a conversation that is going on behind your back of how God is planning on blessing you. Now, Mephibosheth was hiding in Lodabar because he was lame. But he was also hiding in Lodabar because he wasn't stupid. In those days when a new king came in that was not related to the former king, the first thing the new king would do was to execute all the little princes. Why? Because little princes become big warriors, and sometimes big warriors want to invade and take back daddy's kingdom and all that other kind of stuff. So just chop the little princes down, and then there's no problem. So Mephibosheth knew that David had the right to kill him. So he said, because of what my granddad did and how he messed up, let me just stay out of sight. Let me just mind my business. There are so many people in life in this room that you're hiding because you're afraid that that abortion is going to take out your future. You're hiding because you're afraid that divorce cancels out all that God has for you. You're afraid that that bankruptcy cancels all that God has for you. You're settling. You're dropping your expectations because of what has happened in the past, not understanding this one truth. It's not your past that gives you a right to step in your future. It's who your father is that determines your future. You see, what Mephibosheth did not understand was that Jonathan, before he died, went to King David and said, look, David, my dad's messed up. God's left him, and I know that I'm not going to be the next king, but this is what I need you to do. I need you to look out for my boy. He didn't do anything wrong. He was set up. His granddad messed up. Can you promise me that when I'm not on this planet anymore that you will look out for my son and you will bless him the way you would have blessed me? And David said, you have my word. I will take care of your son. So often we're living afraid based on the sins of our grandfather, Adam. Not understanding that there's a new man on the scene named Jesus Christ who has made a covenant that based on the covenant of Christ, Adam's sin does not determine our future. I'm preaching a whole lot better. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 5 verse 17, the sin of this one man... Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm still working my salvation out with fear and trembling. God's working on me. But as I am in my carnal state right now, when I get to heaven, the second thing I do after I say hi to Jesus is going to be to punch Adam in the face. 
You are the only man on the planet that can actually say you have ruined the entire world. You have literally ruined the world. <laughs> the Bible says this sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to be king over all. But all who will take God's gift of forgiveness and acquittal are kings of life because of this one man, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that before you accept Christ into your life, that you're not a bad person, you're not a, a person off track, you are literally dead. That even though you are breathing oxygen, that your soul, your insides, your hope, your passion is dead. But the second you accept Christ as your blood relative, the second you accept Christ as the Lord of your life, he said, instantly, I make you alive. And not just make you alive, but I make you a king over life. Some of, some of you, 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 you at church, you got to tell the truth. You've been coming for Destiny Harvest for like three months now. You love this church. Stop playing. You know you love this church. You can't wait to get here. Your kids don't want to go home. Every Sunday you walk out the door and I'll say, have a great week. And you're just like, <laughs> bacon, you know you love it. You're every Sunday. But yet you haven't joined a connect group yet. You haven't finished growth track. Oh, well, you know, the kids, the kids are fine. The kids don't want to leave. They cry when they get in the car. <laughs> it's not the kids, it's you. You're afraid of people getting close to me. Because if they get close to me, they're going to find out that I don't have it all together. That there's still some things that are in my past that honestly, they're not in my past, they're in my present. There's some things that's just not all that Christian. And, and I don't want anybody to get close to me and figure out that I'm not all that I appear to be. Listen to me. You've completely missed it. The whole point of growth track, of connect groups, of this church is not to highlight how messed up you are. The point of the whole church is to let you know, I get it. I'm right in the same place as you are. But God has made a way that our past can't keep us from our future based on who Jesus Christ is. My seat is searching. For second thing, write this down, write this down, write this down. My, my seat is secure. My seat, my seat, my seat, my seat is secure. So, so they grab Mephibosheth. The Bible doesn't tell us, but I feel like they took him. Hey, the king wants to meet you. Uh, no. <laughs> well, he didn't really ask. Come. They pick him up and they, they bring him to the king and, 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 they, and they put him before the king. And it says the first thing Mephibosheth does is he, he drops to the ground. He prostrates himself and he says, what a dead dog am I? You see, Mephibosheth was still afraid that his past was going to ruin his future. Dead dog was a colloquialism at the time, but it wasn't just that. He said, I'm dead because I'm Saul's grandson. You're going to kill me. I'm a dog because in those days, people who were lame were considered less valuable than animals. And he throws himself. In. He, can you imagine how uncomfortable he was contorting himself before King David? I find so often we're afraid of people rejecting who we are based on what our past is, that we contort ourselves in all different types of ways so that they can't reject us. For me, the way that I, I, I contorted myself was through sarcasm. I was just a mean dude. And I just say anything out of my mouth because I've discovered that if I can make you leave me quickly, that I don't have to go through the pain of rejection when I actually want you in my life and you leave anyway. Some of you, your contortion is you've just put up walls around your heart that you will not allow anybody close to you because you have in your mind, at some point, they're going to reject me anyway, so I might as well reject them up front, con contorting. Some of you, your contortion is charisma. You just make it your goal to make everybody like you. <laughs> I'm going to be the funniest person. I'm going to be the most liked person. Everybody doesn't know me because if I can get them to love me, maybe they'll never reject me. Some people, and there's nobody in this room, it's only the person next to you. Your contortion is control. You try to control and manipulate everybody around you because if I can control them, I can keep them from rejecting me. All because you're afraid of who you truly are. If they ever find out who you truly are, they won't want anything to do with it, and they'll reject you. The problem with Mephibosheth is he did not understand that his seat at the king's table was not based on who he was. It was based on who his father was. 
How would I live differently if I understood that the open doors in my life, the things that I accomplish, the places that I go, the influence that I have was not based on the fact that I have a degree or don't have a degree, the fact that I have a certain amount of Instagram followers or not, the fact that a certain amount of people are in my network. What if I understood that what happened in my life wasn't based on who I am, but it was based on what God has already done for me. And because he's my father, he's opened a door that no man can shut. And if he shuts the door, no one can open it. The Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. However, God is loaded. That's what my translation says. I don't know what yours says. Filthy rich. I'm going to show my age. But you guys remember MTV Cribs? <laughs> All the 90s babies are like, huh? It was like the Kardashians before, but they would go to different people's houses. And let's see how old you are. Remember Method Man and Red Man's house? joint was busted. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> they should try MTV heaven and let God walk you through his wealth and to see literally streets of gold, to see all that he has. The Bible says that he's wealthy, that he's loaded, that he's rich, not in money, in mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is not giving you what you deserve. Let's say hypothetically, and we'll keep it hypothetical because I know we have police officers in the church and lawyers and judges and all that, so it's completely hypothetical for the record. But hypothetically, let's just say that some type of crime might have been committed. And it might be obvious the person did it. Yeah, that was you. We saw you on camera. It wasn't me. It was Chris Rock. That was not me at all. This doesn't even look like me. Let's just say you, you did it. And those people with little shiny little bracelets, they put them on you, and they took you downtown, and you're standing in front of the judge. The judge said, yep, you did it. You did it. And, and, and here's the amount of time that, that your punishment must be. But even though legally this is the amount of time your punishment must be, go free. That's mercy. God says, I'm rich in saying go free. Somehow we were raised with this mindset that God is a God that's going to get you back. And the more you mess up, the more that God's punishing you. Listen to me. We serve a God of go free. We serve a God of I'm not going to get you back. In fact, everything you've done, I've placed it on my son. It's taken care of. Go free. He said, however, God is rich in mercy. He brought us to life with Christ. Remember, we were dead without him. He makes us alive when we come to him. While we were dead as a result of those things we did wrong, he did this because of the great love that he has for us. You are saved by God's grace. And watch this. God raised us up and seated. Did it, did, did. Did it, did. Past tense, did. He seated us in the heavens in Christ Jesus. I don't want to brag. I don't want to act like I'm more important than I am. But I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> I am, I am, I am. You know why? Because currently as I'm standing here, there's a chair in heaven at the king's table with my name on it. The second I surrendered my life to Christ, there was a seat that was placed at his table that had my name on it. And listen to me, there's one there for you as well. God didn't wait for you to get five years of perfect Christianity together before he gave you a seat at his table. He didn't wait for you to get five weeks of perfect church attendance together before he gave you. The second you surrendered your life to Christ is the second that he says, I have already seated you in heavenly places. This belongs to you. How would I act differently if I knew that my seat was secure? You know, church folk be phony. You're phony. You may not even be a church folk. You ever heard somebody tell you some good stuff that are going on in their life? And outside, you're just like, oh, that's so awesome. That's cool. Inside, you angry as I don't know what. They tell you about the new job, the new house, the new car, the new boo, or whatever it may be. You're just like, oh, won't he do it? Won't he do it? And inside, you're mad at them. You're mad at God. Why didn't you do it? Like, are you serious? I know you're involved in North Korea and you're trying to save the world, but my address has not changed in like six years. Blessing here, not there. What if I understood that my seat was secure in Christ and that nobody on this planet could take what God had for me because it was meant for me and nobody is my competition because he has made it for me? You're giving me a golf clap like you're not understanding. How much more secure would I be? How many more risks would I take if I knew the success of my business was not based on my business acumen? 
Start that business and watch somebody give you their client list after you start it. Write that book and watch that publisher pick it up after you finish it. When you understand God has already seated me in heavenly places, it's just my job to trust him and to step into it. Last thing is just write this down. It's, it's my choice. It's my choice. It's my choice. It's my choice to sit down. So <laughs> my man, my favorite chef, he's, he's sitting here. My favorite chef ain't, ain't no dummy. He's like, oh, you, you're being nice to me way Way too nice. This is the setup, right, David? I'm sorry, King, King, David, I'm sorry. You try and kill me. You want me to see at the table and you're going to cut my head off or poison me or something like that. It sounds too good to be true. You know, we, 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 we think like that with God sometimes. No, 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 no. There's no way you just pray a prayer and he forgives my sin and then blesses me. Nah, it's too good. He wants something from me. He wants to control my life. He wants to send me to Timbuktu to be a missionary, something like that. He's going, you know, can't be that simple. David made the invitation, but it was up to Mephibosheth to decide, am I going to sit at the king's table or not? The Bible doesn't tell us, but inevitably, I believe that, that Mephibosheth was looking at the table, and, and he started to look around the table to see, is there anybody seated at the table that, that looks like me? Is there anybody around that I can relate with, and I can think, man, if they could sit at the table, then, then I could sit at the same table. So many of you, you, you did that this morning. You walked in the doors, and the first thing you did is you looked around for someone who looked like you. Is there anybody that looks like they've been through what I've been through? They've experienced what I've experienced. They come from the, the side of the train tracks that I come from. Is there anybody that I can relate with? And I promise you when Mephibosheth looked at the table to see who was seated there, he did not find one person who looked like him. He did not find one lame person sitting at the table. And it would have been easy for him to get discouraged saying, look at all these warriors and these strong people sitting around the king. I don't belong here. But Mephibosheth understood one thing. That as someone who was lame and had issues, when I sit at the king's table, everything that's broken about me is covered. You see, it was his legs that were lame. From the waist up, Mephibosheth was probably stronger than your average man because he had to get himself around with his arms. From the waist up, he looked like a warrior. It was, it was the waist down that was lame. And as long as he sat at the king's table, everything about him that was broken was covered. Maybe you came to church today and you're like, man, I don't fit here. I don't belong here. None of these people look like me. None of them look like they yelled at their kids on the way to church. None of them look like they fought with their spouse on the way to church. They all look perfect. They all look like they have great credit scores. I don't fit here. What you may not understand is this is a church of broken people. It's just that we're seated at the king's table. And when you sit at the king's table, he covers your brokenness. He covers the parts of your life that are your yesterday so that you can have hope for the future. This isn't a place of perfect people. This is a place of covered people. This is a place of people that have decided I'm going to sit at the king's table. And this is a place where you belong. As long as I stay where the king put me, I'm okay. I'm covered. It's only when I start feeling myself and I think I don't need God and I get up from where he placed me that people realize I'm not really all that. I'm just a broken jar of clay that God uses to fill and transform people's lives. So today I have one question for you. Will you take a seat at the king's table? Oh, I don't know, Lodabar, part of my French, it sucks, but it's familiar. My life isn't where I want it to be, but at least I can predict it. At least I can control it. God is saying today, will you trust me? Will you give me a shot? Will you take a seat at my table? Maybe at one point in your life, you put your trust in God, and like Saul, you kind of got busy and forgot about it. You 
went on about your business. And God is saying today, will you come back? Will you trust me again? Will you sit at my table?